Good evening. As always, we want to acknowledge to our Father and our God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings. God is God all the time, and inasmuch as God is God all the time, uh, he is worthy of praise all the time. Uh, in the day of prosperity and in the day of adversity, he is worthy of praise. Uh, in the days of sunshine and blue skies or torrential rain, he is worthy of praise. May we appreciate that praise is more than what we say. Praise also speaks to our attitude, our outlook, and our actions. The psalmist has declared in Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, that's easier said than done, but God is worthy of praise all the time because he blesses us all the time. And for all of God's blessings, we ought to be eternally grateful. We want to direct your attention again this evening to Job chapter 1. Uh, we want to read again there verse number 8. Job chapter 1 verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Based on the words here recorded in Job chapter 1, we want to use this evening for a subject, Can God Testify of Me? And as we consider the text that we have before us here in Job chapter 1, I stand in awe of the man that, God, uh, that Job was. To endure what Job endured and still have the mind to praise God is a great demonstration of faith. I used to be in the habit of saying, when I grow up, I want to be like Job. But somebody pointed out to me, if you want to be like Job, you have to be willing to go through what Job went through. I just admire the man that he is, or was. When you look at Job chapter 1, if you know anything about Satan, you know when Satan shows up, he means no good. And this one who means no good shows up before God, and God brings Job's name up. If ever there was a time you wanted to tell the Lord, look, you don't have to mention me, it would be when the devil showed up. Because you know, whatever God says, the devil is going to try to undermine it. So when God says Job is a good man, I don't think it surprises any of us that the devil went to work to try to prove God wrong. I believe that God has given us the account of Job to bless our lives through his example. And I'm learning that life happens for everybody. And when life happens, stuff happens. And when stuff happens, you better have more than your own intestinal fortitude to stand on. Job is a model of patience or endurance or perseverance. Uh, the Bible declares in James 5 verse 11, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, if you don't know how to look, it's hard to find compassion and mercy in Job's account. But God was compassionate and merciful from Job chapter 1 all the way to Job chapter 42. And I know God was compassionate and merciful because God didn't call just anybody's name when Satan showed up. 
I would submit to you that in our world today, God's compassion is seen not only in his desire for us and that he helps us, but it is seen in his restraint of Satan. We ought to be glad for the restraining hand of God. Do you remember Jesus talking to Peter in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32? He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that Jesus prays for you. I know all the time we ask for prayers from one another, but can you imagine when Jesus himself prays for you? I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when thou art strengthened, see, Jesus is telling him how it's going to turn out even before he starts to undergo it. When you are strengthened, you, you're not going to do everything right, Peter, but when you make up your mind to walk with me, no matter what, strengthen your brothers. Satan surely desired more for Peter and for the other apostles than he was allowed. But what really stands out about Job is what God had to say about him. You know, we'll say good things about each other, but sometimes we have reason to say good things about each other. You know, if you ask me about my kids, I'm only going to say good things about my kids or my grandkids or, or my friends or people that I might need a favor from. But, but let it be somebody that we don't necessarily see eye to eye, and I'm not aware that they're going to be a blessing to my living. You know, we can get very candid when that's the case. But there is no testimony greater than God's testimony. God's testimony, God's witness is a credible witness because, number one, God can't be mistaken about a person's character. You remember Jeremiah 17, 10, that God declares, I know your heart. You, you ever known somebody and the impression you got was very different from the, the person that they showed themselves to be later on? See, God never has that. I know he was like that kind of moment. God says, I know you better than you know yourself. God cannot be mistaken about a person's character, neither can he lie. When we look at Job chapter 1, again, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? I submit to you, that's why God brought Job's name up. God knew who else was alive at that time. But see, Satan, for what you have in mind, I, I need one of my best to withstand the darts that you're going to send. I submit to you, number one, that God testified by who he chose. God needs faithful people. Do you remember Jesus in Matthew 9, uh, uh, verses 37 and 38? There the Lord said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of, of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. God needs faithful people. Now, not because we can do anything that God can, but God chooses to work that way. In the days of Isaiah, God sought for a faithful person. Do you remember in Isaiah 6 verse 8, God says, I sought for a man to make up the hedge, but I found none. Isn't that a poor commentary when God says, I was looking for somebody I could depend on and couldn't find him? God can use everybody, but he doesn't choose just anybody. There has always been a particular manner in God's choosing. There was a reason that God chose Noah in the days of the flood. There was a reason that God chose Abraham when he says, I, I, I need somebody that's willing to leave their family and all that they know. There was a reason that God chose Moses. Uh, you know, somebody to deal with these uh, hard-hearted, stiff-necked uh, Israelites. There was a reason that God chose Mary. 
somebody to father my child and bring him into this world, uh, uh, to mother my child, rather, and bring him into this world. Uh, I believe that God, without providing us all the details, chooses of his people today to use them according to his will, just like he did Job in the text. One of the things that I marvel about when you read Job's account is Job was never privy to the discussions that took place between God and Satan. And nowhere in the Bible record is it ever indicated that God came back and told him why he went through what he went through. All we know is that in chapter 42, God turned his, his captivity. But from chapters 1 to 41, Job had to suffer. And I submit to you that there are at least two significant factors in God's choosing. Number one, he chooses us according to the ability that he has given us. God has not equipped anyone to be able to do everything. That's why he uses all of us. No one of us can do everything. But all of us are able to do something. God chooses us according to the ability that he's given us. Uh, in your Bibles, in Romans chapter 12 and verses 6 through 8, uh, uh, there the Bible declares, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the propor proportion of our faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, no one of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. And God chooses us according to the ability that he has given us. But not only does he choose according to the ability that he has given us, he chooses according to our faithfulness. You remember last Sunday, the sermon was, everyone you count can't be counted on. There was a reason that God chose Job. God brought Job's name up for a deliberate reason. I can count on Job. Did, did you see what God said? Have you considered my servant Job? Now, Satan has considered all of us. Uh, 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 if ever he told the truth, it was when God asked him where he came from, and he said, from walking to and fro in the earth and up and down in it. And Peter tells us what he was doing all that time. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, your, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may desire, uh, devour. You don't think the devil knows us? The devil knows who gets on your nerves. The, the devil knows what pushes your buttons. And, and he does his level best to push your buttons. But can God testify of me? Now notice, not only did God choose Job, but God testified by what he said. Have you considered my servant Job? Now remember, nothing is ever news to God. What God says to Satan, he already knows what Satan wants to try. He already knows how this thing is going to turn out. That's why I chose Job. There is none like him in the earth. That's high praise coming from God. You know, we can be mistaken about people or want to see the best in them when the best is not there to be seen. But God says there is nobody like Job in the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that fears God and turns away from evil. See, God doesn't say something nice about us so that we'll say something nice about him. God doesn't need our niceties. He's already sovereign of the universe. There's nothing we could say that would make God more God than he already is. Or, or no slander that we could utter that would make God less God than he already is. God is never inaccurate in his assessment of a person's character, as we often are. Uh, you don't think that's the case? 
uh, find some married folk. And they'll tell you, he's not the man I thought he was going to be. Well, God never says that. God never says they're not the person I thought they were going to be. God says that Job is one of a kind. But the question is, if you or I were the subject of this conversation, what would or what could God say concerning us? If Satan showed up before God and my name came up, what could God say concerning me? Now, you know he's only going to tell the truth. God is not going to say about me what he said about Job, knowing that I don't want to go through what Job went through, or that I might not even have it in me to be faithful to him through all of that. Now, now I didn't say God couldn't make me able. God can make us able, but he doesn't use us against our will. I submit to you, that what God could say about us is what we are already saying about ourselves by our living. What God said about Job was what Job had been living, not what Job had talked. And you know, have you considered my servant Job? Look at his life. He's a just and upright man, and he turns away from evil. I'm not telling you what Job says about himself. I'm telling you, what can be seen in Job's living. See, self-witness or or self-talk is often a poor witness. In Proverbs 20, verse 6, uh, uh, Solomon declares, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Now, mind you, when Solomon says, we'll proclaim our own goodness, he's not saying we're good. He's just saying we'll talk good about ourselves. You ever hear somebody say, even before I was baptized? Now, I already know when you go back to talking about before you were baptized, you were a sinner. But you ever hear somebody say, even before I was baptized, I wasn't a bad person? Yes, you were. You were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the Holy Spirit's commentary. But Solomon says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness but a faithful man who can find. Well, that's why God testified of Job. Job had shown himself to be a faithful person. And appreciate, no details are hidden from God. You remember Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4? You remember Jesus told her, go call your husband? And she tried to answer that question like we sometimes do by answering the question, but not answering the question, because I don't want to tell a lie, but I don't want to be guilty. Jesus told her, go bring your husband, and so she answers, I'm not married. Well, that's true. You're not married, but you're shacking up with somebody right now, and you've had five husbands before that. You don't ever hide anything from God. Isn't it ironic then that we try to hide things from one another when we stand in God's full sight. Have you considered my servant Job? And then verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? See, Job don't obey you just because obeying you is the right thing. That there's a reason that Job obeys you. In verse 10, hast not thou made an hedge about him? and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. One of the things verse 10 tells us, when you talk to God trying to tell on somebody else, you always end up telling on yourself. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, God was talking to Adam, and Adam trying to lay everything to Eve's charge and end up telling on himself, where are you, Adam? I'm over here hiding because I was naked. Well, well, who told you you were naked? Well, he's going to try to put it on Eve. Well, well, the woman you gave me. You remember, I was down here by myself. I was doing all right till she showed up. I, I, Adam, I don't seem to remember that being your reaction when, when God brought Eve to you. You... Behold, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, woman, 
whoa, that, that, that's where we get woman from. And Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. And, and that just became woman. Well, Satan trying to tell on Job, and he ends up telling on himself. Now, now what's he trying to tell on Job? Job, he, he effectively said, Job is a belly friend. See, the reason Job serves you is because you bless him. But watch Satan tell on himself. Have you not made an hedge about him and about, all his, and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Now, what did Satan tell on himself? I am powerless to touch Job if you won't let me. Now, you're trying to tell on Job, and you end up telling on yourself. I am powerless to do anything because God has the power to stop me. You don't think the devil would do more to us than he's doing but for the restraining hand of God? Yeah, he absolutely would, but, but he's already told on himself, I can't do any more than God will allow. Now, what do we know about what God allows? Well, well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Now, what do we know? God is not going to let anything come to me that I can't handle through his strength. Now that don't mean with my bad self I can't jump out there and, and, and reap some consequences through disobedience. But God says, I won't let any more come to you. Now, now you think you bad, go run on out there and bite off more than you can chew. But in my service, I won't let anything come to you that you can't handle. That's why Satan is here whining. It's not fair. You call Job faithful and upright but you stop me from doing anything to him. Notice what he says in verse 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he had. You don't think Satan wanted to touch Job. But he knew I can't do anything to Job unless it falls within your permissive will. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. God knew Satan was lying. And the thing about it is, Satan knew he was lying, but he lied anyway. Why? Because that's what a liar does. A liar lies even when he knows he's lying. Now, now you, you remember what Jesus said about uh, uh, Satan, John chapter, four, uh, uh, John chapter 8, verse 44? He is a liar and the father of it. He's doing what a liar does. A liar lies even though he knows it to be a lie. Verse 12, the Lord said unto Satan. See, God knew he could depend on Job. That's why he gave Satan license to do what he did. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't believe in God, that's a scary statement. All that I have is going to be in Satan's hand, God forbid. Satan don't mean me any good. And if you've ever read Job, you know what Satan did. Went off and murdered all ten of his children in one fell swoop. Had all of his stuff taken away from him. And Job says, naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. You know what Job was saying? I never had anything. What I came into possession of was God's, and it was mine to be a steward over God's possessions. But if God decided he wanted his stuff back, who am I to complain? Thank God for the privilege of being a steward over it for the time that he gave me. I submit to you that God testified by who he chose, God testified by what he said, but God also testified by what he allowed Job to suffer. The restriction in this case was not Job's limit. And we know this because Satan came back for a second shot 
And God said, you can touch him, but you better not kill him. Satan's always under the restraining hand of God. And you remember what Satan did. He struck him with a disease from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Now, I don't know about you. I don't even like having the sniffles. But to have a disease from head to toe, that means if you sit down, you're in pain. If you lay down, you're in pain. If you stand up, you ever have an ache and you got to lay a certain way just to get some relief? And you lay that way all night long if you have to, if it'll give you some relief from your pain. Well, Job has no relief no matter what the posture is. And I believe that Job would have been faithful unto death. But God wanted him to live so that he could use him even after that. Now, everybody doesn't have a Lord, use me as you please spirit. You think that's not true? Go back and you read Jonah's account again. Go look in the mirror. God needs those that are willing to endure some things. In 1 Peter 3, verse 17, Peter declares, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Now, notice what he says. You can suffer for well-doing. Every time you go in through something doesn't mean something is wrong. Now, it could mean that, but that's not the necessary conclusion. It could just mean that God has measured my faith and decided he can use me as an example for somebody else. You ever known anybody with a chronic illness? but they always have an encouraging word when you talk to them. It, maybe God has allowed them to have that chronic illness to help us by the encouraging words that they speak, even though they have that chronic illness. And remember, God is as much God in the day of adversity as he is in the day of prosperity. In the day of prosperity, God, uh, Job rather, offered sacrifices for his children just in case. But in the day of adversity, Job said, Naked came I out of, out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now notice verse 22 there. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Don't people want to blame God for their adversity sometime? Why did God let this happen to me? Uh, a better choice might be, why did you make the choice that you made? See, bad choices bring bad consequences. But if I'm faithful to God, then I've got Job's outlook on it. I came in with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing, and anything I had in my possession from the time I came in to the time I go out was God's, and God just let me hold it as a matter of stewardship. But any time God decides to take his stuff back, how are you going to get mad at somebody for wanting their stuff back? You let me use your car for a week. The week is up, you say, give me your keys back, and I got an attitude. That's your car. You were doing me a favor. I ought to thank you that you let me use it when you didn't have to. There was a reason God called, called Job's name. But can God call my name and depend on me that I will be faithful to him because it's the right thing to do? God calls us to be saved from the wrath to come by obedience to the gospel. The gospel message is the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried but raised the third day for our justification. God requires that we hear that good news, Romans 10, 17, that we believe Jesus to be the Christ, John 8, verse 24, that we be willing to repent of sin, Acts 17, 30, 31, that we make the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32, 
And then as an obedient response to the command of God, we submit to being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2, verse 38. When we go into the waters of baptism, God washes away our sin by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and he adds us to the church. And thereafter, God wants us to be the kind of child that he can depend on that I can call your name even if Satan is around because I know I can depend on you. Revelation 2, verse 10. Perhaps you're here this evening, you want to respond to the invitation. If that be the case, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.